Uh, next, we have a talk by Ishak Singal. Can jets showing bends or wiggles be relativistic? Hello. I can't say good morning. It's good, but it's afternoon. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So the topic is a bit unusual, somewhat anti-establishment. But in any case, I'll just show you some evidence that our whatever we are talking relative to beaming, is it consistent with the bending, large bending seen in the jets. Now this actually, when I sent the abstract to Priti, then I got one student, she came for about six weeks, two months, and then I thought, okay, this is a good problem, it doesn't need too heavy reading, and just little special relativity if she knows, and then maybe she can get launched into this, and she started working on this, then, but after two weeks, Due to some personal reasons, she left. And uh, so, any case, so this is sort of acknowledgement, but also the personal reason. She's getting married, and she's getting married right now. <laughs> 12 15, uh, 12, 12 o'clock. So, Anand Karaj is the word used for the Sikh system of marriage. <laughs> so, any case, so she had a good reason to leave. <laughs> Okay. Now, this is of course many times seen, many people have shown in this conference, 3C279, and uh, the bottom is put in distance, and uh, if you can see, I think you can see, in about six years, it has moved about 60 light years, so that is about roughly factor of 10. And C is the velocity. So that superluminal motion, of course, many people have already talked and we all know that uh, that tells us that there is some relativistic motion is there and perhaps relativistic BME is there in all these sources. And of course, another evidence, this I'll just come back later. Another evidence for superluminal motion or relativistic BME comes, I hope it's readable comes from the inverse, uh, from the high brightness temperature seen in many compact sources, which was called inverse Compton limit, but I think it is diamagnetic effect, which leads to a condition of equipartition, uh, which is also condition of minimum energy. But in any case, that apart, what I mean is, I'm not saying that inverse Compton physics, something is wrong only it does not become operational because temperatures due to this equipartition remain less than 10 to 11.5 or something. And the inverse Compton limit which starts higher than that doesn't come into operation. It is something like, which I think Bindu will appreciate, that if a naughty or troublesome child is there in the school, and teacher is able to control, you don't need headmistress to control. Okay, so, so inverse Compton limit is a misnomer in that sense. But in any case, that apart, the high brightness temperature which are seen tends to 18 and even occasional cases 10 to 21 have been seen. So those say that the beaming could be as large as 10 to 3 if you want to explain within this scenario. Okay, I go back to. Okay, this is the typical formula which everybody knows that this is the beaming, and for jets, n is generally taken as 2 alpha is spectral index, although in this particular case I'll talk that we need 3. And this, of course, is generally taken that superluminal motion, the source angle is something like 1 over gamma because that you need minimum gamma to explain the thing, that's why we adopt this. However, one thing which somehow, which is well known in literature, but which is not stressed and which many times is forgotten, 
that even if source is moving towards us at certain angles or beyond certain angles, it will not be boosted realistically, it can be actually fainter, and which somehow is not appreciated. So, and this is the angle at which basically you put this equal to 1 and then you get a relation between theta and beta, gamma is of course in terms of beta and that leads to this relation. So, if your angle at which source you are seeing or source is coming towards you versus the angle at which you are seeing, if angle is larger than this, then actually there will be source will be appearing fainter than its intrinsic frame, even the source is coming towards you. In fact, if you are at 90 degree, then from this relation state you get that the delta is 1 over gamma, which is less than 1, of course. So, it is not boosting, it becomes faint. So, in that case, what will happen is, like if this source, we think that it may be in sky plane or a large angle, at least maybe 50, 70 degree. In such a case, even if this is brighter than this, but this may be still much fainter as we see than in the intrinsic frame. And that bright, uh, reduction in brightness could be many orders of magnitude. So, if it is at 90 degree, the source is sky plane, then if it's 10 is the, let's say gamma is 10, then it could be tends to 2, tends to 3 times fainter in your reference frame than in the intrinsic frame. So, that has to be kept in mind. So, in fact, that might be one of the reasons that very large source in sky plane jets are not that often seen. So, in fact, like uh, uh, such a source jet could be 100 times brighter actually. Any case, that's not uh, needed for my talk, but I just pointed it out. Okay, this I already talked. Now, I'm just coming to bends. See, bending in jets has been seen very often and the bends are sometimes almost 90 degree bends are there. And what is seen in many cases that even if there is a bending of 90 degree, the brightness of the jet before bending and after bending, the, there is not much contrast in that. The bending after or before, the jet shows almost similar brightness. I'll just show you some examples. There will be much better examples in literature, but this is just for. Okay, this is milli arc second structure. This is a bending. And then, of course, this what Bindu had shown. In this case also, if you see here, there is a bending, which may be whatever angle it may be, 70, 80 degree, or maybe less. But there is a same contours are there, and there is no change in the brightness. Now, if we say that such jets are relativistically beamed, that means they are at narrow angle to you. And if there is such a change in angle, then either before or after, both parts can't be beamed towards you. There will be sharp change. And if there is no change in brightness, then they cannot be relativistically beamed. Okay. This is another example. Okay, this is whether you use factor of 3 or 2, not very important, although it makes uh, difference in the magnitude of brightness. But just, uh, I'll just give a remark on that. The why factor of 2 comes, basically you can, various ways you can look at it, but you can look at also the time compression due to factor this delta, in the oncoming jet. It, if the jet may last, jet may last uh, some time tall, then you may see the number of components in the jet of this order. And then due to that, one factor will be reduced in this. So if you see the total jet, whole length and compare let's say jet and counter jet, if you see total length and you are able to see the counter jet even if fainter, then of course it should be 2. However, if you compare the brightness of the jet at some small parts, then you should use 3 because you are not taking the whole jet where the components might have died. In any case, that is not very important, but we can discuss it in case somebody has doubt later. And there is another factor there which has not been talked in literature that there is another factor 1 over sine delta, 1 over sine theta, which will also which is not a relativity factor, which is just a geometry factor that if jet is coming like this, whole length of jet, 
if you look at a smaller angle the whole length gets compressed it's an optical thin source so the emission the jet will appear brighter if you take the total jet length then it doesn't matter but if you take the if you are comparing two jets and their relative brightness then that factor also has to be taken into account which is somehow has never been taken into account okay this is just same thing which i already spoken so can bends and even wiggles be still explained and assuming that red city beam so what now of course this uh, i assume in this that there is no change in the speed of jet material i mean i am going to do some uh, exercise later here and there i just assume that the jet has suddenly bends of course it will be a continuous process but we assume that just bends so i want to compare the brightness before and after the bend and there of course here one thing is there that when jet is pointing to, towards you at let's say small angle then the projection effects may make a lot of difference what you see 90 degree actually may be very small angle see when you are looking at something close to line of sight length small change sometime projected in sky may appear large angle so when you say 90 degree it may not be 90 in the intrinsic frame of the jet i mean not even intrinsic frame near the jet okay so that one has to take into account but what is important to us is what is the jet what is the angle jet is making before and after to the line of sight observer so for that one has to so this sort of geometry i will not go much detail but let's say this o is the core from which jet is progressing this way at an angle theta and observer is here this is the line of sight to observer and then suddenly jet decides to change its track its angle by this angle zeta but this angle zeta is not in this plane of observer's line of sight at certain uh, the plane of this change direction makes an angle phi respect to the earlier plane okay it's not very important to uh, go, go deep in this but any anyway, of this mathematics is required if you want to study it properly then zeta is the intrinsic change in the jet angle respect to its initial direction and it lies in a plane that makes an angle phi respect to the plane which contain the initial direction of the jet and the observer then you can simply from mathematics you can work out that the angle projected into sky at which we'll see the bending that will be this eta and that will be related to those this sin theta is the previous angle at which it was coming towards you line of sight and zeta and phi i have explained but this is the angle at which jet will appear in sky bent but what we are interested is that what theta has become theta 1 <coughs> theta 1 is the angle which the changed angle of the jet changed component of the jet is making to the line of sight so that comes by this and equation this is simple geometry anybody can check it then of course there are too many variables the initial angle the change in jet angle plane so in order to constrain and compare with the uh my uh, actual numbers i took let's say 90 degree bend it is seen in many cases so i took that i took that case and initial theta zero i take 1 over gamma assuming that that's the least problematic i mean you need minimum gamma for that then it constrains my observation or rather uh, simulation whatever you say calculation i should say so with those things then this zeta i think it's pronounced zeta right i forget this greek number okay greek word characters so this zeta is the angle which jet is making now with this initial axis and with these things zeta i take then i can calculate the ratio of brightness of new after bending and before bending and that 
uh, just mark it. Remember, this is log scale. So you can see that for different gamma I have just plotted, 10, 20, 30, 40, that you see the brightness will change by huge factors. In fact, any bending, any jet which has got a bend, that bend should not be visible to you because it will be fainter, except unless there is some sort of conspiracy that brightness changes so much, angle changes so much that, okay, which in some case might still give factor one, but that is very unlikely that whatever you do almost the bending bent jet by 90 degree should be in brightness as much as tends to 5 tends to 8 times weaker. So that means either bending something is wrong but these are observations I don't think we doubt or this picture has something missing in which we use relativistic beaming. It's not consistent with the bending actually seen. So I think that's all. I'll just show this. This is just in English, of course, everybody can read. And this is Punjabi. This is my mother tongue. This is Kanda, my wife's mother tongue, which I can call my mother-in-law tongue. And this is Gujarati, of course, where I come from now. This is Urdu, I learned from my father. The Yavanakkam, Tamil, Hindi, and Bangla. So they, I could have put more languages, but <laughs> it will cover the whole picture. So this just to show India has many languages. I just put some. Yeah. So. Yeah.